spirit spiritus. And it's the day Michelangelo that we have some evidence of because this was written by one of my Latin scholar students, so I'm trusting him. Spirito Spiritus, because he wanted to understand the skeleton uh, that what lies under this envelope of skin. So he had an arrangement whereby if there was a dead monk, it was locked in a small chamber and the key was sent to him so that he could actually do some limited dissection. So it's a terrifying situation because he's actually forbidden to cut the body anyway and now he's faced with a dead body. And so what we're going to do with this first one is if you work in twos, one will be the narrator and one will show the action. What we're trying to do is the person who is showing is listening carefully to that which is being told of. So it's very much a partnership. Now, whether the person would carry a lantern with their key, if you were polishing it up, then obviously, somehow to see in the dark something that can blow out and a key would be essential props. So you actually do dress chamber theatre with the minimum or the maximum you think the piece requires. I'm usually working on a minimum because people hire me in to do quick jobs like this. But sometimes, you know, the maximum can be worked on. the narrators as being either skulls of past corpses so that if we were doing it as a piece of theatre the lighting would be of the skulls or you could hold the skull so each of you could be a skull or you could be a stone in the windowless wall. So now let's arrange ourselves so that we have one person who will do that which is spoken of, but the rest of the text is divided between the skulls I'll just call them skulls at the moment. So now, obviously, in the, in the first one, the two Michelangelos would be dressed alike. In the second one, there is one Michelangelo, and the rest are alike, but are symbolic of the death place. So now, will you look through the text, and just simply get yourself right round the room, eight feet by six, you know. So the room is blocked except for the doorway. I'll stand in the doorway for the moment. He stood for a moment rigid before the door of the dead room. He inserted the big key. Made a slow movement to the right. Then left. Felt the lock slip. In an instant, he had opened the door. Darted into the room, room, room. Closed and locked the door. Behind him, behind him. At this moment of commitment, he did not know whether he dared face the task ahead. The room was small, about eight feet by ten, eight by ten, eight, eight. By ten. Windowless. The stone walls were whitewashed. The floor of rough blocks. In the centre of the room, on narrow planks on two wooden trestles, 
and wrapped from head to foot in a sheet. Was a corpse. Why? He stood leaning against the door, breathing hard, the candle in his shaking in his hand. It was the first time he had been alone in a room with death, let alone locked in and on a sacrilegious errand. His flesh felt as though he was creeping along his bones. He was more frightened than he had ever been in his life. What lay wrapped in that sheet? What would he find when... He, 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 he. Now you can see when you look at this one, obviously at the end, what would he find when he, 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 that's one. There's another one, uh, whitewashed, whitewashed. And there's one earlier on with death, death, death. So wherever I put all, I mean all. So everybody has to fulfill the promise of the line that just went before. So we're not talking here about saying a few words. We're urgently conjuring atmosphere. And you can't afford to drop it. So it's an, it sounds crazy, but it's, it's a very early example of finding you can do group work. You can manage it in twos, but now, you're all together trying not to let the ball fall on the floor. And of course, the first speaker sets that in. Now we need a Michelangelo to just do it so that you've got a person to address. And think of the voice of a skull. We're not talking about cracking bones and teeth falling out, of course. We're just trying to get that concentration that the actor will hear that skull speak, then that skull, then that skull. And if we get really clever, the skull can come from all over. We're not that clever, not today. <laughs> we haven't time. <laughs> He stood for a moment rigid before the door of the dead room. He inserted the big key. <coughs> Made a slow movement to the right. Then left. Felt the lock slip. In an instant, he opened the door. Don't rush it. Don't, Don't rush it. it. Darted into the room. 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 Closed and lock the door. Don't rush it. Let it close and lock it. It's a group thing. At this moment of commitment, he did not know where to lock. He dared face the task ahead. The room was small. Give him time. About eight feet by ten. Eight, eight by ten. Eight, eight by ten. ten. Dead walls were whitewashed. The floor of rough blocks. In the center of the room. On narrow planks, on two wooden trestles. <coughs> Give her time. Wrapped from head to foot in a sheet was a Hey. 
stood leaning against the door. Give her time. Stood leaning against the door. <clears throat> we have the candle shaking in his hand. It was the first time. Dong, dong, dong. got to get forward to the course. And she's got a rough floor and no windows and a flickering lantern and a sheet revealing the contours. She's really crying. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're being very patient with me over what must seem an, an impossible exercise, but I wanted to show it. It does work because its material is gruesome sounding, and it isn't a bit gruesome, really. It just looks like it's going to be gruesome. And of course, that very ending moment, does he move the sheet and look on the face of the person? Or does his hand move over the contours of the body? He knows it will be a man and hesitate to move the sheet. Or does he go to the foot and move the sheet? There are so many variables. The scene is set in an artist's workshop studio in Firenze. And of course it is raining, there's a crowded market, and build this up as much as you like. But, what I'm going to ask you to do is consider a job you might be doing as an apprentice in this workshop. And uh, we obviously need Dominico, if anyone wishes to take on that role, we need the notary who will write up the indenture. We need the boy Michelangelo who hasn't a clue about what's going to happen to him. And we have his father. And then, of course, we need Michelangelo, the elder, his father, who is checking the indenture. So we need five people. We have a father that will do the thing and we have a father that will read the thing. This is what Chamber Theatre does for us. Now, this is a frozen moment. You are waiting. You're bringing your son. The notary is there and you 
and you are the same person. But of course, he's got the nature now. Yeah. The 1st day of April, I recall that I, Lubicio di La, di, uh, Leonardo Bonarotti, to apprentice my son, Michelangelo, arm, round to Domenico and to David Di Tommaso Di Curado for the next three years under the following conditions that the said Michelangelo must stay for the stipulated time with the above named to learn the art of painting and that he should obey their orders and that the same Domenico and David should pay him in those three years 24 florins. Show you have the money. Of full Don't pay weight. it. Show it that right. you have the money. You brought the money. It's a lot of money. They're showing me the money. No, no you sure. brought it. I thought you that was paid. I paid. Right. Right. So 24 florins of full weight. Six in the first year. Now hand over six. Then you would count them out, of course. One at a time as you hand them over. So Michelangelo, the son, sees all this gold. And what a pressure to learn well. And then we go to the next. Count them out. Eight in the second year. down on the notary's table. The notary will accept them. Six and eight. And ten. In the third year. Total of ninety six lira. Watch it, you've never seen so much gold. Confirm. A total, A total of, of ninety six lira. This first day of April, this first day of April. I record that I, I record that I, Ludovico Leonardo Buonarotti, do apprentice, do my son, apprentice my son, Michael that's right. Michelangelo. That's right. Two. Two. Dominico. Dominico. And. David Di Tomasa Di Curada. <coughs> he points to a portrait of Curado. For the next for the next three years. And tell it to your son. For the next three years. Under the following conditions. Under, Under the, the following, following conditions. conditions. 
that the said Michelangelo, that the said Michelangelo, start moving away. You don't like this. Must stay. So you near it, and you better have. Stop him moving. Turn round to your father. For the stipulated time with the above named. For the stipulated time with the above named. To learn the art of painting. That's right. Put a real threat into it. To learn the art of painting. And? That boy make sure, and should. and that you and that he should obey their orders, and that the same Domenico and David pay him. And then you smile. You've made it. In those. Three years, says Michelangelo. Look at all the people. In those three years, if you say those words, in those three years, twenty-four florins of full weight. Six in the first year, eight in the second year, and ten in the third year. A total of ninety-six lira. And then you double sign it, you move forward. Now you move forward. And then you move forward. and see this great document. Now the notary will show you all. I tear this and half is given to him and half is given to him. And you must pass it to him and then the rotary has done his job. He can pack up everything, carry his satchel away, bow to the community. This has been done properly. So you bow to the owner who will pay your fee. You bow to those and you scarcely notice the boy. Just look. Looks like you've got nothing to do, doesn't it? But in terms of building up, the pressure on one child, it's an enormous, serious matter. As it always was, you know, you still had, I don't know if it's still done, you need to be bought out of an apprenticeship. The one who says, when I was eight years old, my mum and dad gave me a doll. So if somebody would take on the narrator. Right, good, thank you. And then we see the mother and the father and the little girl handing over the doll. And then later, of course, Sarah is the lady who's acting the role of the child. She's doing everything that is said. But then you see, you need community nurses, doctors, and social services all shouting, you know, special school. So that everybody is dealing with that. And they sent me away to a boarding school. Boarding school. 
And then when I got to the school, there was a headmistress. So we now have young Sarah, father, mother, everybody's the social workers and everything, but then we need the headmistress. And <clears throat> there are no dolls. No dolls. And then, of course, the teacher takes the doll while she stays in the classroom. And then, of course, every night she took the doll to bed. That's on the second page. <laughs> right. Now then, let's see how it goes. God help us all. <laughs> I've been remembering back to when I was a little girl. When I was eight years old, my mum and dad gave me a doll for my birthday. I called my doll Sarah. Every night when I went to bed, I took Sarah with me. And so you go to bed. And of course the narrator is watching her pass. Whispering. I whispered in her ear, shared my dreams with her, told her all my plans. I loved Sarah. She was my special friend. And then we hear the doctors, the community nurses, So you say the community nurses, the community the nurses, the social services, the doctors, social services, said that I should go to a special school. Now this is when the whole group speaks. The doctors, the doctors, the satchel and the parents. And the school in my head is drawn. And when you get to the school, because you've just drawn it, there's a headmistress. When I got to the school, the headmistress said, no dolls in the classroom. No. No dolls in the classroom. And along comes the teacher. So where is the teacher? Who, of course, takes the doll. I take the doll. Yeah. And bids the child follow. And no dolls in the classroom. Calls out the narrator and it is echoed again. No dolls in the classroom. And no dolls in the classroom. No dolls in the classroom. Every night I still took Sarah to bed with me. I told her all my troubles. I whispered in her ear. She comforted me. I loved Sarah. She was my special friend. I was very unhappy at school. I ran away. I ran away. And then all the staff appear. The lot of you, you know. Well, the bride. And then Kevin or whoever did it, somebody comes and they've got her. So whoever comes forward, they are the one who got her. <coughs> oh. Put back to bed. And this time, I 
and ran away. I ran away three times. Right. I ran away three times. I ran away three times. But I always got caught. The third time I was caught, the headmistress punished me. <coughs> the third time, you'll have to be hauled up and taken to the headmistress. Still holding the doll. She took Sarah away from me. She took a pair of scissors. The headmistress took a pair of scissors and cut Sarah's hair. She cut Sarah's beautiful, long, blonde hair. <coughs> she cut Sarah into little pieces. <coughs> and she threw her in the bin. <coughs> and then you can both leave. And we're left with only the old one. Sarah was a doll, but I loved her like she was my best friend. The headmistress destroyed our friendship. She broke us up. But now I remember, and I want to share my story. I still have dreams and ambitions, but I don't want to keep them in the dark. Not like I did when I was a girl at school. I want to tell my stories. We want to tell our stories.